It's all yours. Thank you very much. Ooh. Well, first of all, thank you very much for coming. Um, it is actually a great honor to be at Stanford. Um, when I escaped in 1956 from Hungary, it certainly never occurred to me that I would get here. Maybe, maybe to make the tea, which actually I did in restaurants in London, but that was a long time ago. Anyway, we're not here to talk about me or the tea. Talk here, talk about Formula One, hopefully. And we go back all the way to um, my motor racing career. Um, this is Brands Hatch. 1965, this is yours sincerely, hurtling along the main street. <clears throat> At least I thought I was hurtling along. The instructor pulled me over and said to me, Sir, is there anything else you could do for a living? And I said, yes. <laughs> he said, do it. So that was the end of, it was five minutes, if five minutes. It, it actually was hugely embarrassing. So I realized that I was absolutely hopeless at it. But I decided to stay not too far from the track. Um, so I thought, well, I might as well commentator, a photographer, something like that. <coughs> I ended up looking like this. Well, I nearly didn't end up looking like that because I very nearly got killed. Uh, the pictures you're looking on the other side were taken by me with these cameras, Monaco, 1970. What happened was that the guy up front in the green car, Jack Brabham, thought that he was being chased by the red car. Uh, but he wasn't. He was chased by someone else way back. So he logged up and he hit the barrier exactly where I was. And the reason why the second picture was a bit fuzzy was I was taking it was beating a hasty retreat. But anyway, I survived that one. And after that, I never ever put my cameras on either the straw bale or the uncle. So that was my lucky escape. Yeah. Um, anyway, after you, sir. Yes, well, it was inevitable, really, that Hungary should have started for, you know, Formula One in 1906. Actually, he was a mechanic. He was a Renault mechanic, but one of the Renaults got killed, and they said to him, sis, you drive. So he pulled into this thing. This actually is a statue outside the Ungar ring. And he drove in the very first Formula One race, just outside Le Mans. Um, it was a short race, a little burst, 12 hours. And um, he had a co-pilot, a co-driver. But what was hugely amusing was that when they stopped to refuel, um, they actually had a smoke. Which, <laughs> I mean, if you think about it for a second today, I mean, this is just completely. And then you compare it to this, and of course, there were just the two of them. And here, Ferrari, on a good day, you have something like 29 people surrounding the car. Um, this, I'm moving on to the 20s just to illustrate that these rather beautiful blue cars, the Bugattis, to some extent, ruled the roost in the 20s, and at that time it was still racing, if you like, for the um, for the manufacturers. So if you if a Renault won on the Sunday, you saw some Renaults on the Monday, the same with the Bugattis. Then it became somewhat nationalistic. And I don't mind telling you to my great delight, in 1935 at the Nürburgring, there were an awful lot of German cars and one guy, God bless him, Tazio Nuvolari, and he was not supposed to win. It was supposed to be uh, what you might call Deutschland Nuvolari situation, but it wasn't because von Brauchic uh, was driving so fast that his tires shredded on the very last lap, and Nuvolari came through and won the race, but what was amusing is that there was no Italian national anthem. It was either the German anthem, or no anthem. So, um, but nevertheless, there was very nearly a film made over this, about Nuvolari and 35 and all this, but it's one of those films that, how can I put it, still in development, Hollywood being Hollywood. Um, then, of course, we moved into the proper Formula One era. Uh, what is fascinating, if you look um, 
are the safety features for the, um, for the spectators, or for the drivers for that matter. This is um, Farina in an Alpha winning at Silverstone. And it was a huge thing, so much so that His Majesty uh, King George came along as well. So that was, um, that was very special and that, if you like, is where it all started. Although the cars did look rather different and as you'll see, for instance, the helmets they wore were just very old little canvas caps. They had no um, safety belts of any kind. So the trick was to, if you lose it, try not to remain under it. Mm -hmm. And if you fly out, try and make sure that you don't hit a tree. And if you fly to the 100 miles an hour, just with a motorbike, if you fly off and you don't hit anything, then sooner or later you'll slow down. If you hit a tree or if it falls on top of you, it tends to be curtains. Um, this is to illustrate um, 1961, the Belgian Grand Prix, that in those days you, you had yellow cars for the Belgians, you had red cars for the Ferraris, blue cars for the Brits, silver cars for the Germans. But then, a few years later, it all changed. This was still nations, if you like, fighting, and then <coughs> it all went steadily downhill in a way. Because not so much of this, because this, in fact, is a fabulous picture of Keith Duckworth, Colin Chapman, Jim Clark, and Graham Hill. This was the Ford Cosworth V8, which Mr. Ford paid for, actually. A guy called Walter Hayes, head of PR um, at Ford Motor Company, said to Mr. Ford II, please give us $150,000. We know this guy, Duckworth, he'll build a fabulous engine. And this engine went on to win well over 150 Grand Prix, which is quite astonishing. Um, and Clark, who was not allowed into Britain for tax reasons, flew from Paris straight into um, to Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam. Someone took him to Zandvoort. He saw the car for the first time on the Friday, and he won on the Sunday. And here he is. Um, I think anyone who's, who's ever followed Formula One knows that he was a tremendous, and absolutely wonderful person, and very, very shy. Um, he lived up in Scotland, and he really let, I and mean, you can see this beautiful style of his, he let his driving do the talking. Unfortunately, got killed in a ridiculous accident uh, in 1968. Now, this is to show the most horrible bit of motor racing. Uh, 1968, Rouen, French Grand Prix. Jackie X in a Ferrari is on his way to win his very first Grand Prix, while this poor guy, Joe Schlesser, came unstuck in the biggest possible way on the first corner. And as the car was made out of like these, you might believe, the whole thing went up, including him. This, on the other hand, is what I would describe as a happy crash, because everybody survived. There were 17 cars involved in this. The guy up in that photo, um, Jody Schachter, an Australian who later went on to become the world champion, um, lost it in front of Woodcote Corner, which was the ultimate corner in Britain. And if you lift it off at Woodcut, there's no other word for it, you're a pansy. So the real guys, it didn't lift off. Well, he didn't lift off, except he lost it. And he lost it in such a way that his wing clearly wasn't designed in Stanford, flew off, and there is the wing. And this is James Hunt ducking so that the wing wouldn't take his head off. So that, and it's clear I got Zori behind them. 17 cars involved, you know, lots of damage financially, everybody walked away. These are probably the best act actual pictures, if you like, I've ever taken. It was, it was fun. Not so much for McLaren because they had to repair the cars. But um, this is the gentleman <coughs> who saved more lives than anybody else in Formula One. His name is Professor Sid Watkins. Um, after Senna's accident, which I'll come to later on, he was the man who said, right, enough of this bloodshed from now on, there will be no fatalities in Formula One. And there haven't been any, because he designed the, the, the MAC system, 
and all sorts of extra bits and the cars were crashed if you like into brick walls at a much higher speed with much more force and since the first of May 1994 when we lost Ayrton thank God there hasn't been a single fatality mainly thanks to the prop market this unfortunately or fortunately is where big money took over so it was bye bye nationalism hello big business and I really think it says it all the astonishing thing is that if you look at this picture of John Watson um, the specification was that it had to look like a cigarette packet if you, if you, if from a helicopter that's exactly what it looks like and Marlboro to this day are in Formula 1 they still have a contract with Ferrari the reason why the cars are red and white is partly because of the cigarettes and of course as you know this guy Arrivi Bene or Arrivi Bene Maruzio has just joined Ferrari as team manager having been at Philip Morris Marble for 25 years so he knows exactly what's what and how much money it's been costing apparently Ferrari took a billion dollars over the years from those guys they were not the only cigarette company as you can see Graham Hill with his famous moustache and we've got someone in the room who to this day who has this moustache hello Malcolm um, because of Graham um, this is Graham Monaco winning he won that five times um, gold leaf team Lotus was what it became instead of the green car it became gold and all that red and all that stuff but Graham was the quintessential British gentleman he was huge on British television uh, everybody loved him <coughs> he's been very very good to me over the years this guy what can I say Jack is shirt I'm heavily biased we've known each other for a very very long time he used to ski with his kids but more to the point Jackie was the guy who with Sid Watkins worked tremendously hard to stop the killing in Formula One and consequently Formula Two, Three, Four, whatever. Um, so some people criticized Jackie because they said, Oh, you're soft and you don't want to get killed. And he said, No, I don't want to get killed. I don't want anybody else to get killed. I lose all my friends. I lost Rint. I lost Sappy Siffer. The list is long. Pierce Courage. He said, No, let's just have motor racing without killing. And thanks to him and Sid Watkins, it's an awful lot better than it's been. This is interesting because for students of Formula One, you realize that the guy in the middle, the young guy, is actually Ron Dennis. Ron Dennis, who owns McLaren, who are racing, well, they're racing now. They weren't exactly racing, but they were at the um, last Grand Prix in Bahrain. That last, that's another story. Uh, Jack Rabbit, three times your champion here. Sterling Moss on the other side. But we put this picture up specifically. I mean, Ron doesn't like this picture. I mean, I showed it to him. He said, look, I don't want to see that ever again. Because <laughs> now he has a private jet and the whole, the, all the trimming. But this was Ron. And to be fair to him, he was, he was a garage mechanic. And he used to fill up this guy's brother's <laughs> cars. And bearing all that in mind, he now makes very, very good road cars. And sooner or later, the Honda engine will come good. Because let's remember that. Honda have won an awful lot of Formula One races. One of them goes back, I think, to 1965, Mexico, with Richie Ginther. So that's that's our friend. Now, James Hunt, of course, was the poster child for Marlboro. Absolute <laughs> poster child. Women loved him. He smoked like a chimney, tall, good looking, you name it. Unfortunately, he overdid the smoking, the drugs, the women, the whole thing and we lost him at age 45, which is a shame, but at least he was a world champion. Of course, he featured in the movie Rush, which I know we've all seen. Um, charismatic in some ways, could be very outspoken. Um, he used to commentate on British television with Murray Walker, and he would say some fairly outrageous things, but being James, he could get away with it most of the time. Mario Andretti, I don't have to introduce, great American hero, here he is winning, um, again, 
uh, cigarette money John Player special 1970 this picture was taken in Zandvoort it's a it's a dynasty dynasty I mean there is Mario his son Michael uh, they are successful to this day I believe in Indy and also they got involved in this new electric formula which I don't know too much about my son's just been to see the first race maybe he can tell you a bit more about it this is a guy who used to come and eat at our place uh, Nicky Lauda. Nicky Lauda came to Britain in 72 and I'm, I'm sure that almost everyone in this room knows the famous story when he wanted money from his rich grandfather and the story goes I knocked on the door I went in he said I put on a tie for the first and only time in my life and my grandfather was sitting there and he wouldn't even turn around he was reading the newspaper and said I understand not understand I saw your name in the sports pages come back when I can see it in the business pages goodbye and he was thrown out but with family money nevertheless he managed to get some money from the bank Formula 3, Formula 2, world champion, very nearly lost his life as we all know but the priest went to give him the last rites after Nürburgring and we told the priest where to go uh, and six weeks later came back to Monza with blood pouring from under his uh, racing car. I mean unbelievable. He's not a particularly nice person as those of you who follow Formula 1 to this day know um, but very sharp very astute, very outspoken, and a great driver. Tremendous driver. I owe Forza to him. I owe it to this photograph. I'm not going to bore you. Uh, sufficient to say that when Forza started, I had nothing to show except this picture. And the editor was good enough to say, okay, but if you know Lauda, you must know Formula One, get on with it. And that was issue one of Forza, and now we're on 142. So that was fun. This little French guy, Alain Prost. Um, very interesting. Not many people talk about him, even though he's won four championships and someone whose name didn't stick, not like Michaels or Atoms or others. Very, very fast. Um, it's hard to describe him because having done some great driving, he then got involved in business and lost a fortune, not his own not his own money, but other people's money. He had a very, very unsuccessful racing team. Now he's doing a little bit better. He's now a um, TV commentator. I once managed to get him out of jail in Naples, Florida, but it's another story. <laughs> um, if you like, I can tell you very, very quickly. He, he turned up with his family. They were on the beach in Naples, Florida, and being crossed, of course, you rented a speedboat. Wow. So the police went after him and I happened to be very near on the next beach and I could see this little guy, this huge policeman. So I trotted across and said, can I help him? He said, well, I won't try and do the accent. He said, look, this guy's been speeding. I'm about to do all the, throw the book at him. And I tried to explain that he was terribly famous, world champion many times over, Please, please, please don't put him in jail. I promise I'll, I'll make sure that he'll never ever speed in America ever again. And the cop, God bless him, um, let him go. But uh, to this day when I see Anna, he says, thanks for keeping me out of jail. <laughs> now we come to this great, great British hero, <laughs> R. Nige. Um, I'm not saying he was or is the brightest person on God's earth. But as far as driving is concerned, on a good day, he was amazing. He could, on Nige or Il Leone, as the Italians called him, he would winch, he would cry, he would faint, you know, theatrics all the way. But on the track, on a good day, he was just about unstoppable. He was very unlucky here. This was Australia some years earlier, when his tire blew two or three laps from the end. He would have been world champion there and then, but it's a great photo taken by Keith Sutton, who is a great friend and who is to this day one of the great photographers. That was the end of it. But in 1992, he did actually win the, uh, the championship. And then he went on to the United States and he won over here as well. 
now he's retired. Um, his greatest victory, as far as the Brits are concerned, were level two. One when he beat Nelson Piquet, whom the Brits really didn't like. I don't like. Um, and the other when he beat Senna. And in fact, this is him and Senna dicing in Belgium. I think my son Nicholas did the picture. They had tremendous fights. Senna won most of them. Um, I, I've always liked Nigel, and, and the Brits absolutely adored him. And when we come to the Senna picture, I'll show you why. Um, this, is, this is the classic picture from Silverstone. Um, Ayrton's car broke down, and there is Ayrton on the left, on his knees, saying something like, oh God, what have I done? And I don't know if you can read it, it actually says, don't worry, Nigel, only nuts come from Brazil. Uh, so this summed up the love for Nigel by the adoring British public. And after this, there was a track invasion. And some purists said, oh, how can they invade the track? Well, because as far as they were concerned, Nigel was the great British hero. And to many of them, he still is. Michael, what can I say? Uh, apart from wearing the same shirt I was wearing in 1993, uh, which is true. Um, I can see the stripes. Uh, he and I have a very, very good relationship. And of course, this was Silverstone before Bernie ruined it. There was still grass, there was still, you know, there was, there was no concrete. Um, you could walk up to someone, have a chat. This, in fact, was in 1995, and he would stop on the scooter. No PR people, no PR lackeys, no somebody listening to every word, you know, as to what he was saying. He was just, he was just another guy who happened to be a very, very good racing driver. Picture at the bottom is where he and I were working together at the uh, Hungarian Grand Prix. We all know what happened to him. I often talk to Sabine Kem, his PR lady, who actually a very, very special PR lady who said, I don't think we'll ever see him. I don't honestly think we'll ever see him again. And if we do, it's not a picture we would want of him because yes, he's sitting on by Lake Geneva and he communicates with his eyes. It's not the Michael we knew and loved. His son just started racing. Um, I hope he'll be successful. I don't think his father really knows. What is really sad is that when Fettel won the other day for Ferrari, Michael's wife sent an email to Fettel who just dissolved. So I can understand that. Um, this guy was probably the most human of, of all great champions. Not only did he win five times, um, that's the only time I met him, unfortunately, down in the bottom. But in 57, he managed to catch Hawthorne and Collins at the Nürburgring in the 252 Maserati F. But beyond that, he was a fantastic human being, always very kind. For instance, he would let Sterling Moss pass on the last corner at Aintree at the British Grand Prix. And even though he denied it, the fact of the matter is he lifted off and let Sterling go past. Um, there was another occasion and that's when he retired. He had a pro protege called Musso. And he said to Musso, this was in 58, he said, look, if you see the leaves on that corner, and if the leaves are floating in the air, watch it, it's going to be damp underneath. If the leaves are on the ground, you can go as fast as you want. So Musso, clever boy, looked at the leaf, ah, I can't do it, boom, straight on, killed himself. Fangio retired that day. Um, Michael, we've, we've, we've talked about him. Ah, oh, ha, ha. Yeah, no, everybody's hero. Everybody's hero. Uh, Mr. Bernie Eccleston. And as the title says, no angel. What I like is that he knows he's no angel. He actually gave an interview to the Daily Telegraph and said, I don't think I've ever had anyone killed. Now, draw your own conclusions. All I know is that on one occasion, his wife Slavica was wearing a million dollar ring in London, in Chelsea, and two bad gentlemen decided to A, hit him and take the ring off. So he went to the police and the police get a little piece of paper saying, well, here's your claim for. 
and Bernie put the word out because he was the first to admit that he knew the whole of the London underworld. He still does. And then when people said to him, well, what happened to the bad guys? Uh, the word is that they're under one of the uh, motorway construction sites. <laughs> but nobody can prove it, and as long as Bernie lives, nobody will have the guts to tell the story as it, as it really happened. But look, uh, the Hungarians are so keen on him, they issued a set of stamps with, with his, his name on it, just to make sure that they can keep the race. Um, there are governments groveling. Um, he's not talking about moving to Azerbaijan from Monza. I'm as upset about this as you all are, because as far as I'm concerned, Monza should be sacred. Not to him and not to his bosses at CBC, who unfortunately only seem to care about money, taking as much out of that one as they can. I'm sure it's going to change after Bernie. And interestingly, the organizers of the Chinese Grand Prix said, um, we'll review the situation in a post-Bernie period. So people are beginning to talk about this 84-year-olds because he's made a lot of money for himself, a lot of money for CBC. He's done some good things. He's been very good to the Hungarians. They, they put the race there. But the way, for instance, he just tweeted the German Grand Prix, one of the great classics, I personally find unacceptable, and I think most of us do. It was over a few million euros, which to him and to his bosses at CBC, is less than petty cash. And with German world champions, lead, you know, with, with Rosberg, with Fettel, with Halkenberg and all those guys, plus Mercedes pouring a fortune into Formula One, I think it's very bad for him. Of course, his uh, compadre, the guy with whom he's been doing things or doing business for a long, long time, is Max Mosley. Um, and unfortunately, Max agreed to sell the rights, the commercial rights to Bernie for 100 years, which means that theoretically, we're not doing very well. But I think that the guy in the other picture, Jean Todd, would have the power to say that the deal was illegal and start from scratch. And that's what I would like to see, so that proper circuits remain and irrelevant circuits go away, if you like. By the way, I love Austin. I think Austin is fantastic. I think they've done a superb job, and I just hope it will continue as is. I think the locals are very enterprising. I just have to tell you this very quickly. It's difficult to get to the circuit. So four or five miles from the circuit, it says, park here, we'll come and get you. Mm -hmm. So you park there, they run you up to the circuit, when you finish, you tax them, they come and get you, and they have a barbecue at their place, or for 30 or 40 bucks. I mean, I, I just think it's, 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 it's brilliant. And the people are unbelievably friendly, and I think Austin is a glorious place. That's just me. So this was our friend Bernie. This, this I wasn't going to put in, but then a friend called Mike Dudson, whom you may read, wonderful guy, he said, you must tell the Vodafone story. In 2001, we were all summoned to the Hotel de Frey Monaco. And this will show you how big company PR doesn't always work. We were all summoned only to be told that the Vodafone the telephone company will be sponsoring Ferrari. And everybody, cast of thousands, literally, Hotel de Frey is a big and very fancy place, as we all know. And is there any questions? So I put my hand up. I said, Mr. Gent, chairman of the thing. Here I am, I've got a Vodafone thing in my hand and there's no connection. Mm -hmm. And the whole place just dissolved. And to this day, any, every time I see Luca di Montezemolo who was killing himself laughing, he just goes, no connection. <laughs> so, so much for Vodafone who of course have moved on to McLaren and now they left McLaren and I'm not quite sure what's happening to Vodafone. It's not for me to discuss. Now this, uh, as they say, last but not least, may surprise you. I mean, what is that car doing with Jackie Stewart in a Formula 1 presentation? I don't know if anyone in this room knows. It's, uh, it story goes back to 1972-73, Austrian Grand Prix. Uh, the, um, the mayor of Zeltwig goes along and says, Herr Stewart, what do you think of our place? 
Jackie said, well, it's a very nice place. The only problem is that the cows go out at four, four o'clock in the morning, the cow bells on, and we can't sleep. So it's Herr Stewart, as of now, all bells will be removed. And they were. Because I should add that in those days, everybody lived in what's called Zimmer Fry. There were no grand hotels. Jackie stayed in one, we stayed in another, Regard Sonison in third. They were all little Zimmer Fries, and we all just rented rooms upstairs, downstairs, wherever. In fact, I went to the race on a bicycle, just stuck my press bus on the front, and off I went. Anyway, I think we've got one more picture, and you may wonder why. I haven't been talking about these guys. Well, obviously they're all champions. I was wishing he could be where he was all those years ago. Kimi, we've just seen come second. Fatal, of course, is a completely different person. Totally revitalized, loved by the Italians. The bells are going in Marinello and all that. And Luis, well, Luis is Luis. Um, the reason I didn't talk about all these guys, that it's very simple because I'm lucky you lovely people invite me back. So the next talk will be all about that. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Terrific, and I hope you realize that he made this up all last night. <laughs> sure. uh, we have time for questions. If you'd like to ask questions, just ask him any question. <laughs> okay, well, uh, first segment, okay. Go ahead. You mentioned uh, some of the tracks uh, the ones that you don't like. Um, can you tell us? Tracks uh, that you don't like. The tracks that you, you don't, don't like. Don't well, like. I'm not... <laughs> it's difficult. See, I like tracks where the supporters are real. So, barring, if you just take an isolation, it's a perfectly nice track. But there are no local enthusiasts. If you take something like Silverstone, you have 10 or 15,000 people sleeping in tents and having barbecues and blending. And it's a bit like a tailgate situation, if you like, in the United States. And consequently, that's why I love Monza, the, the atmosphere of Monza. How can you replace it with an Azerbaijan where I don't think they've ever seen a car race in their lives and it's purely that the chap running it, and incidentally, there are no human rights in Stanley in Azerbaijan, unfortunately. Um, he, he said to Bernie, how much? And said, oh, I wrote out the chat, here you are. So now they're trying to move Monza. To me, Monza is sacred. It was, the, it was outrageous that they, they took it away from the Germans, and it's even worse that they took it from the French, because that's where it all started in 1906. So unfortunately, to Bernie and CBC, absolutely no circuit is sacred. Bernie that I'm sorry. Isn't Bernie own a French track? Why isn't that in the Formula One calendar? What's that? What was the Paul Ricard. He has Paul he, he, he owns Paul Ricard. Um, and he claims again that the French didn't give him enough money. Um, so at this rate, we're going to end up with Dubai, Bahrain. The Mexicans are having a go, I understand. I don't quite know what's going to happen there. I just hope Austin stays because Austin, in a very short space of time, established tremendous follower, following an ambiance. And I really believe, hand on heart, that Austin belongs to th that small niche of real Formula One circuits, if you like. Um, I'd like to ask you something about the current status of what's going on within Formula One, especially having to do with the business aspect of it. Uh, you know, this, this revolves around the, the engine formula, and as late as last Friday, they were talking, Bernie was talking about bringing back the V8s. Supposedly, over the weekend, there's been a change about that. The justification for it that Bernie gives has to do with cutting costs, so I don't see how bringing another new engine in, or bringing an old engine in, a reworked one, is going to cut costs. But then, but the other issue has to do with the loss of television viewers around the world. And I'm just wondering, is Bernie playing a game with us? It, it, how would, how would you parse out this situation? I, I, in many ways, I entirely agree with Bernie. I mean, this, this soundless Formula One to me is, is an accurate. I mean, V8 or V8 Thunder, uh, v, V8, V10, V12 in the Ferraris. I mean, 
you listen to those things and there, there was a place called the master kink in the at the old spa racetrack and, and you could stand on that kink and you could tell the real guys from the other guys but they lifted off or not because you could hear this glorious v12 and the way it was singing now I, uh, it's very far very fast lawnmowers in my book so i agree entirely with the burden on the v but i think it's gone too far the other way so I think the next step is going to be that they're going to make these things louder and they will try and get it up to as near to a thousand horsepower as possible. Okay, because last time I got there, the drivers, the drivers were actually complaining that there was a safety hazard. That was during the V10 era. Well, the problem now is, of course... Question? What was the question? That... I'm sorry. I'm saying question? that the last time that we, that, that, that we got to a thousand horsepower engine during the V10 era, the driver's crew complained about it, saying it was a safety hazard. Well, you know, they say motor racing is dangerous. I would say that American football is a thousand times more dangerous and so are many men as a sport. Um, I, um, I would like to see a thousand horsepower and I don't mind if it comes from a two cylinder, four cylinder, ten cylinder. Let's have sound and let's have speed. And you know what? At a thousand, some of the lesser players will drop off or spin off. I mean, as Jensen Button said, right now, it's too little horsepower. Too easy to drive. And it's not me. It's Jens. Of course, it's easy for him to say to go faster, right? He's thinking if it stands. Of course. Yeah. Well, I wondered if uh, a lot of us uh, started out reading Rob Walker and Road and Track to get our coverage of uh, Formula One. Did you know him? He must have bumped into. Yes, him. the ultimate. Well, another ultimate British gentleman. Right. And the awful thing is that um, Seppi Sifford drove for him in that beautiful uh, blue car, and sort of thing that happened. Regrettably, was that at Brands Hatch, he, he made a mistake. He, he was under the car, the car caught fire, and the fire extinguisher wouldn't work. That's the sort of thing that could never happen in these days. Rob Walker was fantastic as, as a gentleman, as an owner, and as a journalist. Lovely guy. I have a question. Uh, everybody's talking about electric cars now. What, what? What's the story? Are they going to Is it all right if I ask my son to answer that one? If he knows the answer, yes. <laughs> more, more than more than I do. What's the what's the question? Electric cars. You've just been to the race. Why don't I, you? I don't know if anyone's seen that. Well, I went to the Come and come, come. Oh, I guess. Sit down. <laughs> um, I'm not going to take over his speech. I'm his son, so I had to live with this. Uh, and it's my sister Annabelle. We we went to our first Formula One race. Um, Kick, literally kicking and screaming, age six weeks. <laughs> and, um, so I can't hear very much these days. You know, it's real cars. Jackie Ix actually predicted that my sister and I would be twins in 1971, and our mother didn't know that. And uh, we went back two weeks later, or uh, a month later, to uh, the Bush Grand Prix, and uh, uh, and my father said to Jackie, who was driving for Ferrari at the time, said, uh, you know, you were right, Jackie. I mean. That's, that's pretty good for a racing driver. And he said, because he was very good looking and he was a very naughty boy. And he said, you know, uh, Andrew, I did it without touching your wife. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so uh, Formula E, uh, I, I don't know if anyone's been to a Formula E race. I uh, wasted my time and went uh, a couple weeks ago uh, to, uh, to Long Beach. I was a guest of Andretti, which was very nice of them. I was with Michael Andretti, so I was with a great team, great name in the pits. You know, don't get too excited about that idea, and um, and watched. You know, um, you know. I mean, I, I could go Formula E racing with my lovely stepmother Susie in her Prius, and it would be more exciting. Uh, I promise you. At least he gets some angle out of the thing. And um, uh, I spoke to Mario and Dretti about it on Sunday on the grid at Long Beach, and he said, Nicholas, tell your father good luck for his speech, and don't talk to me about Formula E. I'm not interested. That is not the future of racing. Uh, so I, I don't think it's the future of racing either. Uh, it is not uh, entertainment, and um, it is not entertaining. Uh, I don't know how you define entertainment, but that is not for me in any way entertaining, any way uh, shaped around Formula One or anything to do with motor racing. Um, I think it's very good for Mr. Agag and for um, uh, for Jean Todd to, uh, to 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 have green credentials and to, uh, in theory, make lots of money out of this. Idea. They've just raised, I think, 100 million from uh, from Malone and Discovery Channel or Discovery Networks. 
I don't know how long that money will last. They were on the, already running out after a third tranche of investment. So I give it two years. I was speaking to Stefan Johansson, ex Formula One driver, yesterday about it. Uh, and he said, you know, he didn't even bother going to Long Beach. He lives half an hour away. He said, I wasn't going to waste my time. So maybe we're all too old and we're too traditionalist and, you know, we're not in the whole electric uh, uh, business and it doesn't excite us. We're, we're just too, too pure for that. And, uh, uh, and maybe it's the next generation uh, of you know, 13, 14, 15 year olds who, who will think it's the coolest thing since sliced bread. Um, I doubt that because it's, there's so many more things to do that are a lot more entertaining than watching electric cars that don't go past each other, have to stop after 20 minutes and you jump in the car. And then even the concept of jumping out of the car and jumping into another car, um, which kind of sounds cool that the drivers can kind of race from one car to the next car and they jump in and put the belts half on and then go out. And they say, oh no, no, no. That would be dangerous. We can't do that. So it's a one minute, 15 second window that you can have. So then you have the guy arrive, leap out, dive into this car, the mechanics jump all over him, and then they just sit there for 45 seconds. <laughs> and the guy with the lollipop is, you know, shaking, and they're waiting for this thing, and you just think, are you kidding me? So anyway, that's my, that's my former re commentary. So, so, so I, he got a controversial topic here. So let's continue on this. First, let me give them a I have a wife, uh, two daughters, two granddaughters, and a female dog. So that prompted the question. You probably see where I'm getting. How come there are no women drivers? Can they drive? I mean, Formula One. Formula One. I had a student here, a woman, who went to the Air Force, wanted to be fighter pilot. She said, no way. So finally, he. he, he managed to get into the fighter mm. pilot school, and she could, became the top ace, the very top ace. That's why they didn't want her in. Yeah, that's why they didn't want her oh, in. Oh, that's my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just answer. Excuse May me. I answer the one about the, the, the lady Formula One nonsense from Bernie? Truth of the matter is that the ladies don't want to beat each other, they want to beat the men. As Jensen Button said, Paula Radcliffe is faster than I am. And poor, and this lady Susie Wolf yeah. apparently is very very close to to getting there. I would love to see it. So let's not have this discrimination nonsense. Oh, you girls go somewhere else. No, let's have someone like Susie Wolf in a proper car on the front row of the grid. I think it would be sensational, especially yeah. if they're good looking. Yeah. 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 Well, she's good looking as well. Yeah. Any other? Sure. There was a question here. I'm sorry. No. I read where. Uh, in engineering in Formula One magazine, that uh, what's his name of Red Bull, the top designer, top Andrew engineer, Andrew Newey, Newey uh, praised uh, the technical challenges of the hybridization and the, all the turbos and the electric motors and so forth, and thought that it was uh, it had a lot going for it. it apparently, drew Honda back in, uh, and I can't resist saying that all the guys that love the big motors, I, and I experienced this at Indy. You rose back. I mean, you can't hear yourself think if you're anywhere near them. And most of those guys that follow the circuit are deaf. Well, uh, but may, a, what Adrian say? made a fortune out of this. He's a brilliant engineer. He's just this far off legitimate, illegitimate. I mean, he's sort of skating along. Oh, yeah. But that's that's fair enough. Um, he's so much in love with Formula One that he just went off to design a racing yeah. boat with. Um, gentleman whom we know, Sir Mel, British? Ben Ainsley? Ben Ainsley. Ainsley. So Ben Ainsley and Adrian Newey are now in a little team called, I don't know, Rule Britannia or something, and they're trying to beat the Americans at the next America's Cup. Doing fluid dynamics, just like he was yeah. restricted yeah. so oh. heavily with uh, yeah. a Formula One. Yeah. yeah, but that belongs to this guy and some of the yeah. PhD guys yeah. in this room. Like you should, you should see what the they're studying next door, and you should yeah. see some of the carbon fiber that these guys have. It's unbelievable. But you're, you're right in what you say that the challenge that, and the frustration that we all have is that we love if you actually go out and hear old racing cars, uh, an old Ferrari yeah. Formula One car with a V12 engine back in the 90s. My goodness, I mean, that's the way it's supposed to sound. Even in Austin last year, the Red Bull team did a street demonstration down Congress, I think it was, and they had, of course, smartly, you, they were using the, the car from two years ago. So they had, you know, real, uh, I was actually listening to it on the way up here on my headphones, and I was like, <laughs> that sounds like a real Formula One car. So now they don't, I, I don't know if you, how many of you have heard the modern day Formula One car, but there's really not much going on at all. And 
you know, anyone who's ever been, for instance, to Monaco Grand Prix, and I highly recommend going if you haven't, um, you know, it's a little basin, and that's what magnifies the noise even more, and you really have to wear your earplugs. Oh, and well, it's I the heard first that. year ever that we were on, we were on a boat watching the Grand Prix, which is where you, you know, should do it if you can, and we we're watching the Formula One, and the cars are coming past, and everyone took their earplugs out. And in fact, when the GP2 cars came around, they put their earplugs back in because they're running V8s. It was the first but time ever. I was at Monaco, as it happened in the last year of the Turbos, and it was plenty loud, I thought. I mean, not, was... the, not, not the current generation. No, not the current. Yeah, but current the, generation. The previous Turbos were yeah, very loud. Sure, back in, well, back in the 80s. Yeah, well, that's what they're, they're trying to get yeah. back into, you see. Yeah. Sound. This reminds me, I'm, I'm, I, I'm a golfer, the worst golfer ever. Uh, <laughs> there are two ways you can play golf. You can count or you can cheat. <laughs> I don't count. But I want to tell you that I also, if you look it up on a golf, there's a golf digest magazine and there's a technical advisor pen and a money. And people, the big golf club manufacturers have special engineers for the sound of the golf. So, so oh. because you get a club that sounds ping, it's no yeah, good, even yeah. though it may be the best club. So, so the sound to, to people in the sport is very important, regardless of the performance. I know this first. Thing. Yes. I was just curious. Uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. I'm looking forward to part two. Um, That's out, next week. Okay. <laughs> um, out of the current group of uh, drivers, from your point of view, who do you think is an up and coming, you know, underrated driver? I mean, excluding those on the on the screen who, who do you think who well, you uh, well a, a, a lot of people rave about uh, uh, max uh, Verstappen, and i must say i really thought it was a bit of a joke at age, age 17 but he's been doing amazingly well um his father is an is was an ex uh, uh, in fact he's very likely to be with us because the car blew up under him in, in uh, 1994 95 and he came to the hungarian grand prix with a burned nose he was very lucky to escape that. Um, but he obviously groomed his son from the age of four on. It's nice to see someone like him coming along. Um, as far as the others are concerned, well, um, the, the thing, what's happening is that the old boys, such as Alonso and Button, are getting relatively new, near to retirement age, whether they like it or not. Um, and Kimi, Although some of us would love to keep him, and he's a huge crowd favorite, he again is getting on a bit. So it's great to see someone like Verstappen, and this guy Sainz, I think he's done fantastically well. There is Ericsson from Sweden, who is the first guy for 33 years to come out of Sweden. I mean, Ronnie Peterson was my hero, and that was a long, long time ago, and Gunnar Nielsen as well. Um, and I think that guys who are sort of in between now, like Maldonado and Harkonberg, I think they're they're being sort of slightly overtaken by the even younger talent, and maybe and the engineers in this room would know because they grew up playing all these various games and their simulators. Maybe it's possible to learn the craft earlier than in previous years when you did two or three years of Formula Three, two or three of Formula Two, and finally you graduated. Now you seem to be moving from. Um, one of these games straight into Formula One. Um, so if we were to get back to a thousand horsepower, these young guys might come unstuck. <laughs> and actually it would be quite nice if they were to come unstuck. But um, I mean, I'll be honest, I would love Ferrari to come back and win this championship. I don't personally think they will. I would love to. And I would love, um, and, and somebody else who is very, very good, of course, this is Bottas champ. Uh, he's not he's not terribly good for Formula One in as much as I don't think he would sell ice to the Eskimos you know he's just not charismatic and I think you have to be someone like Lewis even if he's a bit outrageous sometimes and by the way I, I personally I'm, I'm not making a big song and dance about this uh, Chinese lady getting sprayed I think you know that was that was just nonsense. There was a storm in a teacup. We had enough sexual harassment on the campus, so let's keep that away. <laughs> any other any other question? <laughs> yeah, the name Adrian Louis was mentioned. When you listen to American TV on Formula One, you describe him as an intuitive, uh, aerodynamic genius. I don't 
quite know what that string of words means. In this department, we have some very fine aerodynamics that's either very mathematical and they're very computational. It, is Adrian Newey a guy that does it? Let, let, I just want to answer for a second. I would like to introduce, I can't introduce all of that, I'd like to introduce the Christensen, who's a professor here, and a good friend of mine. Uh, you are all, or most of it, I believe, are Formula One nuts, but he's Formula Two nuts. I mean, he is all into Formula One. We started graduate school together in 1959, so the friendship goes back. We had a lovely wife sitting next to me. And so that's why I introduced him. Thank well, you, George, but is that the answer? <laughs> So, so let me let me introduce my ex friend. We've <laughs> <laughs> been through this before. <laughs> I, I I think that he uh, Adrian is is a bit of a one off. He um, I think he Royal Air Aeronautical Society and every conceivable uh, society that you guys uh, are part of. And he's also on top of it. He he's also a racing driver. Um, and he often and very often um, flips his cars. But so far he's been lucky. Um, he just seems to be, he's a bit like Ross Braun and, and some other guys. Um, he, he just seems to pull it together. Um, and there's more to him than just the computers. And the, it's, it's hard to define him, he's a bit of a one-off. Well, that's kind of the old time way, and it's great that it still exists. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. But, but he, he, he must have had enough, otherwise he would not have moved on to design boards. I dare say that lots of carbon fiber and all things that you guys do. And I understand that. Didn't you have something to do with that America's Cup thing, with your carbon fiber gizmos? Well, this is about you, not me, so. <laughs> I think, I guess. I know, uh, our mutual friend, Bob Lutz, uh, opined that we should open up Formula One to automakers doing whatever the hell they want to do. And I think that would be an interesting idea. Who cares whether it's 12 cylinder, two cylinder, whatever um a lot of these brands you look at the the vehicle and it has nothing to do with the automaker or at least that one can perceive i mean i haven't seen too many renaults that have much to do with their the formula one and i think that would be remarkable oh i i i, I love it i mean the, the more the merrier you know the gms of this world and ford motor com coming back again I think it would be absolutely marvelous. I, I think there are too many rules and regulations that would have to overcome. I would I would make Lutz the president of the FIA mm -hmm. instead of Jean Todt, who's gone all soft. I mean, he was brilliant at Ferrari, and now he's gone all soft and not, you know, he's all involved in all sorts of other things other than what he's good at. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I, I love the idea. Last one, then we have to Does the uh, FI, what value is the FIA? I'm sorry. What value does the FIA bring? Safety. Safety. Safety, absolutely, because uh, Sid Watkins worked, Professor Sid Watkins, neurosurgeon, brilliant. He worked for the FIA. He was the head of the safety committee, and he's the guy who's been saving all these lives since Ayrton. Uh, the rest of it, politically speaking, I think they're at, oh, and there's one other thing, they try to control cheating after the race, you know, the way the cars and all that sort of stuff, and the helmets and everything. Um, but beyond that, politically, nothing. I wish they would, I wish they would break the 100 year um, agreement with Bernie, give the circuits back to countries such as Holland, if you like, Dutch people, huge motor racing fans. They have a brilliant circuit called Zandvoort. Um, he, he sometimes talk, oh, I'm going to take it away from Spa. I mean, Spa, to us, is sacred. You can't go to, to some of these funny places where there are more camels than spectators. You know, it, it belongs, to my mind, it belongs to people where the enthusiasts are. Well, I think we we'll stop here. Uh, some people have to go to the dorms to get their dinner, otherwise they miss it. Uh, but we we'll so can linger on a little bit here outside, and I'm sure and we will be glad to ask And thank you all for coming. If we have another one of these, we'll invite you again. Thank you. Thank you.